Uh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Paris Chopra and today I'm with David Pierce. Uh, David is a British philosopher who's played a key role in defining and promoting transhumanism, a movement that challenges humans to go beyond their biological evolved uh, limitation and constraints. Uh, David, is most, uh, David is most well known for writing uh, The Hedonist uh, Imperative, a manifesto that he wrote in 1995. Uh, um, explaining how modern technology can and should be used for eliminating all suffering in all sentient life. Uh, he calls this the abolitionist project. So that's what we're going to discuss with David today. What is suffering? Uh, how should it be eliminated? Why should it be eliminated? And what would a world uh, beyond suffering would look like? Um, so welcome, David. Very excited to talk to you today. Very happy to be here, Paris. <laughs> Fantastic. So David, let me kickstart with a question about your uh, history and background. How did you get interested in thinking about uh, suffering and eliminating suffering? Um, well, I'm a third generation vegetarian. My grandparents on both sides are vegetarian, three of my eight great grandparents. Uh, I'd always been preoccupied as long as I can remember with the problem of suffering, not just in humans and non-humans. Uh, but essentially it seemed to be insoluble that all the traditional ways of trying to get rid of pain and suffering founded on the hedonic treadmill and the horrors of the food chain the hedonic treadmill is this set of negative feedback mechanisms in the central nervous system that stops most of us being very happy or very sad for, for long. Uh, the food chain is, of course, uh, essentially Darwinian nature, red in tooth and claw. And yeah, although I mean, I, I call it the abolitionist project, the founder of the abolitionist project was really Gautama Buddha. But sadly, the noble eightfold path can't recalibrate the hedonic treadmill, nor can it uh, overcome the horrors of the food chain. And so, yes, uh, from my teens and beyond, I became very interested in uh, biotechnological ways to get rid of suffering, not just in, in humans, but throughout the living world. Didn't Gautam Buddha said, uh, we need to be free of suffering? rather than eliminating suffering? Um, yeah, one has to be quite cautious. I mean, sometimes I would describe myself as a secular Buddhist, but the problem here is that you can be sure that someone will say, ah, you haven't understood <laughs> the true meaning of Buddhism. So instead, uh, I would simply, oh, you know, the, precisely what Gaut the, the historical Gautama uh, Buddha said has to be called apocryphal. But nonetheless, he is popularly supposed to have said, I teach one thing and one thing only, suffering and the end of suffering. And modern technology, in particular genome editing, uh, promises uh, Gautama's vision to be realized, not perhaps in the way he would have envisaged, but the historical Gautama Buddha seems to have been very much a pragmatist. If it works, do it. I don't think if he were uh, around today, he would be uh, chiding us for not following the noble, uh, the noble eightfold <laughs> path. I think he would welcome uh, genetic engineering with open arms. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's tackle the sort of corniest question first. What is suffering? How do you define suffering? And is it similar to pain, or do you mean something else when you say suffering? Um. I'm not sure it would be possible to define suffering to someone who had never experienced anything below hedonic zero. But if you are in extreme pain, if you're in, if you're in agony or despair, the nature of suffering is self-intimating. If, on the other hand, you, you just experience a little pinprick, it would be rather fanciful uh, to call this pinprick suffering. Uh, the precise threshold above which uh, mere uh, pain becomes outright suffering is conventional, but it's not arbitrary. And though I advocate and tentatively predict, anticipate that we're going to get rid of 
all experience below hedonic zero. I mean, the first step, the most morally urgent step is to get rid of suffering. Uh, and to do this, I think, yeah, we're going to have to create life based on information sensitive gradients of well being. The, it's a bit of a mouthful, but the information sensitivity is absolutely critical. You've got to be able to respond to noxious stimuli, whether uh, uh, physically noxious stimuli or, or psychological uh, adversity too. It's not, not just a matter of uh, uh, pressing your foot on the, on the pleasure pe pedal, so to speak. <laughs> so you mean, um, I mean, it, it is sort of like, it is difficult to define, like you say, if someone hasn't experienced suffering, how do you define suffering? But uh, you're broadening the definition beyond just physical suffering. Uh, you're oh, including yes, psychological so. suffering. Yeah, Ment ment yeah. Uh, the reason that tragically 850,000 plus people take their own lives each year is predominantly because of psychological mental pain i mean physical chronic physical pain can lead to depression which then leads to people taking their own lives but yeah mental pain can be absolutely uh, dreadful too and yeah the abolitionist project in the broadest sense uh yeah involves physical and mental pain I mean, in one sense, it's a false distinction. All pain is mental in the sense that, you know, even when you stub your uh, toe or catch your hand in the door, uh, yeah, the actual pain is, 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 is inside your head. But nonetheless, this, there is this crude distinction we, we normally draw between mental and physical pain. Right. And you use this term hedonic zero. Um, is this, I mean, like, is an emotion like boredom closest to what you mean by... Hedonic zero. Hedonic zero. The term isn't isn't mine. Essentially, it is emotionally neutral experience that is neither good nor bad, uh, and probably most people uh, spend a majority of their life a little bit above or a little bit below hedonic zero for a lot of the time. I mean, sadly, as we know, there are you know the depths of despair, and if one is lucky, occasional joy and and fulfilment. But yeah, emotionally neutral. Boredom is slightly complicated in that it is it is actually unpleasant that at least some people, rather than endure their own company, will self-administer because they get bored by it. Will self-administer a mild electric electric shock. But uh, yeah, th think of uh, hedonic zero as yeah, no suffering, but also no joy, just emotionally neutral. Okay. On your Wikipedia page, you're described as a negative utilitarianist uh, in the sense that you uh, promote removal of suffering uh, as a priority as compared to increase in pleasure. Uh, why should that be? I mean, have I captured this correctly? Yeah, so it's it's a it's a lousy brand, uh, negative <laughs> utilitarianism, but it really just captures the insight, Gautama Buddha's insight, that our overriding moral obligation is to minimize, mitigate, and prevent suffering. If we can create pleasure, happiness, joy, fine, but ethically, uh, that is what really, uh, really matters. And so, yes, I'm a, a negative utilitarian, suffering-focused ethics. But I think a lot of people misunderstand what negative utilitarianism in, in involves, in that if one is a negative utilitarian, one wants to get rid of even the faintest hint of disappointment. So if the idea that you're not going to be able to enjoy gradients of superhuman bliss makes you a little bit sad or disappointed, well, yeah, it's not uh, a negative utilitarian policy to prevent your enjoying superhuman bliss. Uh, yeah, I, I said, I, I tentatively uh, uh, predict that transhuman, post-human life is going to be orders of magnitude richer uh, than anything that's physiologically possible today. And I think this is a good thing. And I'm speaking as a as a negative utilitarian. Okay. Within that framework, um, how do you, I don't know, doing the math of what is more negative or what is more sufferable is hard, but uh, you can imagine a really 
uh, I mean, a really sort of negative experience for a day versus slightly negative experience for a year. How do you balance if you had to dedicate your resources to solving one of those two challenges? Yes, I mean, in one sense, in one way, uh, utilitarianism is quite straightforward doing philosophic calculus. If you're talking about the same intensity of pleasure or pain, things become more complicated if there are if if the intensity let's say you know how does one weigh one person's intense suffering against 10 people's uh, moderate suffering right. and i don't have a uh, a pat off the shelf answer for you uh it's it's by no means clear i mean it, i I'm, I'm inclined to say that more is different qualitatively different and that i don't think any number of pinpricks somehow uh it's you know well let's start that sentence again imagine someone being tortured can any number of avoiding any number of pinpricks uh somehow be more important than the torture and i would say i would say no um, I would so have to, are, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, these are qualitatively different in comparison. Yeah, yeah, quali yeah, qualitatively different. There are there are there are strong, intuitively powerful counter arguments here. But yeah, I would, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and and where do you stand in terms of uh, say death, and maybe painless death? Is that also something that you advocate we should be avoiding? Um. I think it is prudent to uphold in law the the sanctity of life and something like euthanasia though I think it should be legal there need to be a whole host of safeguards around it um yeah in one sense yeah simply not being around anymore means no more suffering uh freedom from suffering which is good but nonetheless uh yeah for evolutionary reasons a lot of people are afraid of death aging mortality uh if uh, a loved one dies it causes uh yeah a great deal of uh suffering to the bereaved uh and yeah as a transhumanist uh i hope that we can uh, phase out the biology of aging though that is going to be a monumental challenge right um so clearly david so clearly suffering played and still plays an important role i mean it evolved because uh, it played a role in our survival um so in in that sense um uh, it, it i mean on the on the surface it seems implausible that we can completely replace the role of suffering uh, why should it have evolved in the first place so what's your stance on that i mean do you acknowledge that it plays an important role? Yes, I mean, and actually, suffering, pain, physical pain does play an important role. The question is, is it indispensable, or is there a more civilized signaling system? Uh, and I think one needs to look, for example, at the growth of robotics and how it is now possible to design uh, silicon robots with you know programmable digital computers uh, uh essentially that can avoid noxious stimuli without the nasty raw feels of pain and so one option for the future is offloading everything onto smart prostheses but not everyone wants to go down this this cyborg route and as a preliminary step, and this is what I would personally advocate, pain sensitivity, uh, essentially it's a continuum. And though there are dozens, hundreds, in fact, strictly speaking, genes implicated in pain processing, we each of us has the so-called volume knob for pain, the SCN9A gene. And what I advocate is all prospective parents uh, have access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling and choosing benign versions of the SCN9A gene. Uh, now, as I said, 
dozens, the SCN 9A gene has dozens of different variants, and they're associated with either high or low pain thresholds. Uh, nonsense mutations completely abolish pain, but they also abolish nociception, the ability to respond to noxious stimuli. And nociception is, is vital. And so at least until until we offload everything onto smart prostheses, I think the sensible civilized thing to do is to make sure our offspring uh, have high pain thresholds. If you've ever met the kind of person who says, yeah, I don't like pain, but it's just a useful signaling mechanism. I look at people today who are extremely high functioning, but have very high pain thresholds. And uh, yeah, as uh, on the route to getting rid of any kind of pain and suffering altogether, I think that is uh, yeah the way we should be going. Now, there are ways to uh, mitigate and prevent uh, pain in existing humans. More counterintuitively, there are ways to spread uh, uh, benign versions of the SC SCN9A gene to free-living non-humans via synthetic gene drives. Um, one can, of course, uh, use uh, pain reduction mitigation uh, technologies for uh, factory farmed uh, non-human animals, but I think our priority there should be getting rid of factory farming and slaughterhouses, not, uh, uh, not welfareism. <laughs> right. Um... So I have a couple of I mean, follow-ups there, but the first one that was coming to my mind was um, around say pain reduction techniques such as anesthesia. Now we've had them for quite a while, but uh, uh, people don't prefer anesthesia. They, they would rather not have anesthesia than they would have it. So, and I think similar case with uh, strong painkillers perhaps. So what's your view there? What's deficient in the say proto suffering elimination technologies that people wouldn't pick them free willingly? Um, well, I mean, the most powerful uh, tools at the moment, well, if, assuming we're not talking about anesthesia for surgery, but the most powerful pain-killing uh, drugs are the opioids, mu opioids. Uh, unfortunately, as we know, opioids have all manner of problems they induce tolerance and dependence they make people emotionally self-sufficient which sounds good but uh, yeah essentially it destroys the basis of social and and family life uh essentially opioids are deeply flawed as 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 drugs i mean i said if you take a, a mu opioid yes in one sense you experience you know a hint of buddhist nirvana bliss without desire however as i said all manner of problems and the root there though i should stress this is rather uh, speculative is to raise i think it's to raise people's endogenous opioid function and one of the most exciting uh, discoveries uh, last year, uh, dreadful year in many ways, uh, but uh, yes, the Luxembourg Institute of Mental Health uh, devised, uh, the name of the drug is LIH383, and it blocks a dual function receptor in the brain that seems to regulate your endogenous levels of opioids. Uh, uh, the, uh, the ACKR3 receptor, if any techies are, uh, are listening. And the, the, the function of this receptor essentially is to grab, sequester your endogenous opioids, and that by blocking this receptor in a controllable way, the idea is that it, it should be possible to lift people's uh, hedonic set point, lift people's pain threshold without the pitfalls of existing opioids. Now, these are early days. The history of psychopharmacology is littered with false dawns. There are all kinds of pitfalls ahead. But if we are morally serious about getting rid of suffering and we aim to help existing sentient beings and not just future generations, then yeah, we, we need to uh, tackle the biological genetic roots of suffering. Okay. Um, so 
David, walk us through, and I know this is very exploratory at this point of time, but uh, what is the sort of uh, solution space you see for eliminating suffering? In what steps should we pursue it? I know you've talked about in your manifesto, genetic engineering, uh, uh, new drugs, and you're talking about prosthesis, uh, robotics, and so on. Uh, what what sort of steps do you see uh, humanity take towards this post-suffering world? And can it start today with the existing humans or do we have to just hope our descendants will be post-suffering? It can start today in various ways. But having said that, I think anyone who is contemplating bringing new life and suffering into the world has uh, an obligation to use, uh, if it's available, pre-implantation, genetic screening, and counselling. Now, it's, this, this uh, tool is most commonly used, actually, in India and China. It's done for the purposes of, sadly, of, of gender selection, but it could equally be used for the purposes of choosing hedonic range, hedonic set points, and pain sensitivity. So yeah, that in terms of, 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 of future humans, but starting today is what I would strenuously urge any prospective parent to consider. Pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling isn't genome editing. As we know, the first CRISPR babies have now been uh, born in rather unfortunate circumstances. This is coming, and I hope one day all future babies will be CRISPR, or at least designer babies. But that's for the future. Okay, that's with, with future, future humans. What else? I think probably the most, uh, the, the biggest source of severe and readily avoidable suffering in the world today is factory farming and slaughterhouses. That's a big, uh, a sheep, a cow is as sentient as a human toddler. Uh, and deserve, they deserve to be treated accordingly. And though in a minute, if you like, we can explore the idea of reprogramming the biosphere and getting rid of suffering and free living humans before we can actually start actively helping free living non-human animals, we've got to stop systematically harming them. And I would favor a twin track approach of moral advocacy for a cruelty-free vegan lifestyle, but also given the prevalence of moral apathy in humans, uh, the rapid uh, development, commercialization of cultured meat technologies and animal products. And I would be very keen in lobbying to get all factory farms and slaughterhouses outlawed. I would, you know, on an emotional level, I want to stamp my foot and say we should be doing it now. What we are yeah. doing to non-humans is monstrous. Realistically, I think we should enact, uh, legislators should enact legislation that kicks in, let's say, in the year 20, uh, 2030, which gives a tremendous commercial incentive uh, for companies, entrepreneurs to develop cultured meat products and it's worth stressing, given that some people worry about this, that cultured meat needn't be genetically engineered. It's, it can be completely genetically uh, natural. Uh, in fact, it can be more natural than the products of factory farming and slaughterhouses. Uh, so, yeah, and once we do make the transition to, yeah, essentially either a vegan or realistically vegan in vitro lifestyle, I think we can consider the final leg of the, the abolitionist project, which is going to be uh, suffering in nature. Um, <laughs> Okay, so short term, uh, which is very practical, abolishing um, or at least going towards eliminating and reducing animal suffering, either through outlawing family, uh, f uh, factory farming or through uh, uh, having this cultured meat and also advocating uh, selection of uh, babies so that the hedonic set points are higher. What about yes. midterm and long term? 
where, where do you see this going? Which is essentially, I think we are going to gain mastery over the pleasure pain axis. And though the most morally urgent thing to do is to get rid of severe suffering or just suffering of any kind, rather than rest satisfied when the last experience below hedonic zero has occurred, which probably a few, possibly a few centuries from now, more pessimistically, yeah. a thousand or more years. I think it's highly likely that we are going to ratchet up at hedonic range and hedonic set points. And that if today life is spent between schematically minus 10 to hedonic zero to plus 10, that it will be possible to have civilizations, let's say, of a, a plus 70 to a plus 100 or a plus 90 to a plus 100. So, yeah, states of lifelong well-being that are orders of magnitude richer than anything physiologically possible today. Now, why, you might ask, why not be sort of maximum 100 all the time, uh, so to speak? Uh, yeah unvarying bliss like unvarying suffering destroys in information sensitivity and at least for the foreseeable millennia or goodness knows how long i i see information sensitive gradients being preserved and conserving information sensitivity is useful for all kinds of other reasons uh one you know it's uh, information sensitivity means that critical insight is preserved intellectual progress is conserved also in terms of trying to sell this uh, this vision of the future of uh, life on earth uh, recalibrating your hedonic treadmill doesn't involve sacrificing your existing values and preference architecture unless one of your existing values and preference uh, preferences is keeping your hedonic set point where it where it is uh, it's just yeah just imagine waking up this tomorrow morning in an exceedingly good mood you've still got your same you know core values what do you think of as important you still support the football team you do and so forth um but yeah your just def default hedonic tone is 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 much higher uh and yeah if we focus on hedonic recalibration it undercuts a lot of the arguments against uh, you know traditional utopias which traditional conceptions of utopia always involved winners and losers and always involved one group imposing their will on another group whereas the idea of hedonic uplift at least is how i would uh, uh, conceive it is that it it benefits everyone I mean, it sounds almost too good to be uh, 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 true, but simply ratcheting up everyone's hedonic set point doesn't involve losers. It's uh, to get to give an analogy. Um, yeah, if if you get a fifty percent pay rise and all your colleagues get a hundred percent pay rise, rather than being pleased, the chances are you'll be cheesed off. Yeah. But if you get a 50% increase in your uh, hedonic set point, even if other people were to get a higher uh, increase, you would actually still be happier. Uh, in practice, I don't know any reason for that kind of, uh, of, of moral dilemma. It's that these technologies should be available to, uh, to everyone. The price, the price is collapsing of, uh, of uh, yeah, for example, uh, right. uh, uh, yeah, essentially uh, 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 having your uh, genome sequenced. I, I, mean, I did want to talk about uh, what gives you confidence that a hedonic uh, zero will remain constant uh, what if it keeps on adjusting upwards uh, uh, as we increase the sort of maximum of it? I mean, a lot of things in life are zero sum, especially around status and other things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's slightly different from hedonic zero. But yeah, in, in terms of so many, I mean, there is one vision of the future that is of unlimited abundance. This is what transhumanists promise and it's true uh, that uh, in one sense yeah we are going to be able to have an unlimited or effectively unlimited abundance of uh, physical 
good so that yeah no what if uh, but and this is this is the point that this is the point you're raising that a lot of the things people desire are zero sum positional goods status goods you know people you know compete competitive sports yeah. are uh, extremely uh, popular and I mean, yeah, I could outline my personal uh, vision of what we should be aiming for, but uh, it's also possible in virtue of raising hedonic set points to continue. If someone, you know, they're a fanatical chess player, they hate losing, they enjoy winning, uh, by ratcheting up the hedonic set point of the world's chess players, I mean, they can still each fanatically pursue winning and they much prefer winning to losing but when they lose their uh, they it induces a dip their dip is still uh, uh more exalted than today's than today's highs crudely yeah, I mean, speaking that sounds i mean hard to imagine given that we've never had that experience so uh, you expect a certain disappointment if you're losing in a competitive sport yeah i mean it's <laughs> the psychiatric name is hypothymia the, there are <laughs> this is, is is jargon there's dysthymia the kind of person who is just chronically just grumpy low mood maybe they don't satisfy the criteria for th for clinical depression but they're quite sort of bleak and pessimistic there is notional euthymia now that's a bit of a a misnomer normal mood for most people but then there are this uh, this relatively small group of people with a very high hedonic set points they're not out of control manic they just love life i mean i often give the example of my transhumanist colleague anders sandberg who's who says i do have a ridiculously high hedonic set point i mean i'm just deeply envious but <laughs> yeah um, but even people who aren't like Anders Sandberg, I mean, you know, if, if, if one plays computer chess, I mean, I sometimes say computer chess. Uh, uh, yeah, I play to win. I want to win. And I much, would much prefer winning to losing. But nonetheless, when I lose, and I, <laughs> I always do, uh, yeah, it's in one sense, yeah, it's a slight dip, but it doesn't it doesn't take me below uh, hedonic zero if I'm uh, uh, yeah been in a good mood starting the game. So yeah, it's it's counterintuitive. Most people most people are aware of the fact that it's possible to be chronically depressed or chronically in pain. Tragically, there are some people who spend most, if not all, of their life chronically depressed or in pain. But it's it's much more counterintuitive the idea that it's possible to spend all one's life above hedonic zero, but still with with with, with peaks and troughs. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Essentially, yeah. Uh, there are, in terms of the actual engineering in the brain, there are se crudely two separate neurotransmitter systems: the opioid system and the dopamine system. And if you think of crudely dopamine as mediating desire, motivation, urgency, a sense of things to be done, by amplifying mesolimbic dopamine function, you can boost motivation drive by boosting mu opioid function you can boost this hedonic tone happiness and they're uh, semi-independent well i shouldn't say semi-independent the actual systems interlock but nonetheless neuroscience uh, experimenters have teased them apart and it's possible to create bliss without motivation and motivation without bliss or well-being or one can combine combine the two and yeah it's possible that transhumans posthumans will be blissful lotus eaters but it's also possible that they'll be hyper motivated i mean i don't know these are just different options okay uh david you talked about information sensitivity uh and how it's important in the context of if we raise a hedonic set point to a uh, much larger several orders of magnitude we could lose information sensitivity can you talk about what you meant by that uh, why is it useful maybe with an example 
Um, oh, sorry. By by losing it, I mean that even in a realm, a, a sci-fi realm of life between, let's say, between plus 70 and plus 100, here you have in one way more hedonic contrast, but nonetheless, the plus 70 could still be more wonderful than your peak experiences. Um, by information, sorry, if I wasn't, it wasn't entirely clear, by information sensitivity, uh, yeah, in the case of you know noxious stimulus or, or danger, you've it's you know the thought of, uh, of of any form of physical damage to your organs and so on, yeah, has got to prompt uh, avoidance action. It, 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 okay. It's you know no susception. Um, but in the realm of you know and think of any other realm you like of of, of academic life uh social interaction yeah uh gradients of well-being are going to be critical unless we offload everything to our machines <laughs> so um just to make sure i captured that right you're saying the the difference between um hedonic states is important because it lets us function uh uh in in, in the world and but that the difference the absolute values could all be positive rather yeah. than be a negative yeah. or a positive yeah. And an example, I mean, I sometimes, even though I'm a crashing prude, I sometimes give this is, 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 is lovemaking that if done properly, lovemaking is generically pleasant throughout, but it has peaks and troughs. Now imagine a, a cerebral version of lovemaking just in terms of everyday life being gradients of well being. Civilization can still function. You can still preserve critical insight. Uh, there can be intellectual, social progress, but nonetheless, there aren't the nasty, raw feels of pain and suffering as they exist today. Now, one question that might cross your mind is, well, why didn't evolution design something like this? Yeah. Um, short answer would be that uh, evolution simply doesn't care. There's this monstrous engine uh, for yeah, creating pain and suffering. Evolution is all about maximizing inclusive fitness. And uh, yeah, so there is no uh, evolutionary imperative to maximize well-being. On the contrary, discontent pain, suffering have been extraordinarily uh, uh, adaptive. But uh, yeah, life doesn't have to be that way. In the case of something like uh, depression, why did depression evolve? A uh, ghastly set of experiences uh, seems to be an adaptation to group living. Uh, the spectrum of uh, uh, depressive feelings are associated with behavioral suppression, keeping your head down, being unmotivated, gloomy. Uh, it's a kind of low risk, low reward strategy that if you, whereas people who are incredibly optimistic, life loving, it's high risk, high reward. So, you know, they go out and do things, but they're also more likely to challenge the dominant alpha male and uh, come to a, a, a sticky end. And one of the, the risks of ratcheting up hedonic range and hedonic set point is that, yeah, are people going to engage in more risk taking behavior if they are fundamentally optimistic? Uh, and yeah, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, so you might imagine that the happiest people uh, tend to have shorter lifespans because they take too many risks. But it's actually surprising. Well, not surprisingly, it seems to be depressives typically who have the shortest lifespan. A major depression can knock 20 years off someone's oh. uh, life expectancy, whereas the people who love life most are also keenest to preserve it. And perhaps it's telling that some of the people I know who have the, the highest hedonic set points, the most life-loving people, are also, are also focused on the field of existential risk, global catastrophic risk. So yes, in theory at any rate, yeah, being very happy can promote risk-taking, but it also uh, promotes a kind of love of life and yeah, the urgent desire to protect and preserve it. 
Okay. I was, uh, I think reading some studies that talked about, uh, depressive people have a better model of the world that, uh, in terms of differentiating truth from false, uh, they're able to differentiate it much better. Do you concur with that, that they have just a better understanding of the world? Broadly, uh, yes. So-called depressive realism. Uh, I said, uh, although I don't want to make, I don't want to lower anyone's mood. My own view of reality, Darwinian life, uh, suffering is incredibly bleak. And yeah, though I'm not clinically depressed, I do have what one might call a depressive mindset. But as our long-term goal, I think we want to replace depressive realism with euphoric realism, i.e. create a world in which reality seems conspiring to, to help you. Uh, and it's clearly a monumental challenge. I think it's going to take centuries, perhaps millennia. But I think we should be very clear about what the goal is and the steps needed to, 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 to take us there. Okay. Um, it's, uh, I mean, possibly, I mean, some of your listeners may be thinking, well, is this just some crazy trans transhumanist? But if you look at the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization uh, defines health in terms of complete physical, social, emotional well-being. Now, the vision that I'm outlining is in some ways less radical than that, because I think we should be aiming for information sensitive gradients of well being. Complete well being would destroy, uh, 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 yeah, uh, information sensitivity. So okay. uh, it's actually enshrined in the, the founding constitution of of essentially a global uh, organization that has, if not universal respect, at least uh, widespread uh, respect. Okay. In one of your previous comments, uh, you talked about um, uh, this delegating pain or information about pain to machines. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is the, like, the ultimate extreme of uh, this, this maximizing hedonism? And Well, if... If you, as I said, this is just an option and it's not mutually exclusive with other options, but if you are happy to cede control of the function of nociception to prostheses, uh, that yeah, it would be possible to, with a smart prosthesis to arrange that if your uh, hand is uh, on, let's say, the hot stove, that uh, essentially the device kicks in and you and you withdraw your hand even more rapidly than you do today. I um, mean, you okay. presumably would want some kind of manual over, uh, override so you didn't feel you had lost control of your body. Uh, but yeah, uh, cyborgization, in some sense, it's probably coming, not under that ghastly term of cyborgization. I mean, if something like Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk's uh, uh, vision prefigures something like this that, uh, yeah, though I don't think we're going to see a complete fusion of humans and our machines, nonetheless, yeah, with a, a neurochip, essentially you will have access to superintelligence. In some sense, you can become uh, a superintelligence with uh, a sufficiently uh, sophisticated uh, neurochip. And as well as the AI, it'll be possible to uh, enrich your body with smart prostheses. So you'll be physically able to do all manner of things you can't do now. And, and this is the most morally relevant point, it would be possible to offload the function of, of no deception. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when, when people talk about technology's role in mediating our uh, hedonic experiences, things like addiction uh, really come into prominent view, especially with opioids and even social media. They feel great, but now there's an increasing talk that uh, it's literally an addiction. So what's your view there? Um, do you see a possibility of, and, and most people, I mean, I don't even know how to characterize addiction. So how do you characterize addiction? And what's your view there? Is it good, bad? Well, we are all born opioid addicts. Uh, that's yeah, the actual basis for why one 
enjoys anything, finds any anything at all rewarding, is the endogenous opioid system. And yeah, uh, most people think that it is morally permissible to bring new life into the world. Uh, yeah, addicted uh in some sense uh to opioids actually i should rephrase that because most people probably aren't necessarily aware of the precise neurological basis of reward but this is what one is doing one is creating opioid addicts uh and uh yeah i think if one is going to be creating new addicts then one has a, an obligation to satisfy their cravings and evolution doesn't do this social media uh, don't do this so many of the environmental reforms political socio sociological forms one can urge don't actually fundamentally recalibrate the hedonic treadmill uh, so yeah i would urge everything from universal basic income uh to free healthcare, to guaranteed accommodation and a long long laundry list of things that i think would make the world a better place political social economic reform but essentially the hedonic treadmill would would still grind and unless we are actually prepared to ratchet up uh hedonic set point and hedonic range then none of these reforms are actually going to substantially reduce suffering which is it's yeah it's it's yeah i think by addiction i was trying to ask uh, and you must have been asked this question so many times so uh, if there's a machine you can plug yourself in and it just keeps feeding you um with pleasurable experiences non-stop uh is that something you know one should willingly choose or you would willingly choose well, separate questions uh, there in a sense. Uh, there is wire heading. This is the idea yeah. that with electrodes, it'd be possible to indefinitely self-stimulate your reward centers. Uh, now, why, it used to be called, uh, they used to be called the pleasure centers, but it seems that wire heading actually 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 activates the mesolimbic dopamine system so what you're really inducing is this frenzy of desire but yes in principle with electrodes it would be possible to induce unvarying bliss it's probably not sustainable for a society at least not 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 yet uh in that yeah wireheads opioid addicts don't want to breed uh more you know baby baby wire heads but uh yeah certainly in cases of intractable depression people who are not helped by existing antidepressants or uh chronic pain uh i think wire heading is acceptable but it's it's not uh a solution i think for society as a whole uh, you mentioned, uh, I think you may have been hinting at Nozick's experience yes. machine. Uh, and yeah, with immersive VR, immersive cross-modally matched VR, it should be possible to engineer designer paradises. So all the kind of stuff you might have fantasized and dreamed about, you could experience in VR that seemed perhaps more lifelike, more vivid, more real, more intense than what had passed as reality beforehand. And yet, if we don't tackle a uh, hedonic uh, set point, if we don't recalibrate, it's counterintuitive, but essentially, even in future designer uh, VR paradises, there will still be existential angst, depression, uh, unhappy love affairs. Essentially, evolution didn't really design us to be happy. Evolution designed us to be discontented. So, although I'm as keen as, as anyone in the, on the latest uh, technology, developments in virtual reality technology, by itself, it's, it, it's not going to cheat our reward circuitry. Right. What's your suggestion or recommendation to um, uh, people who do certain pleasurable things in the short term, but they end up accumulating a negative sort of experience in the long term? For example, smoking cigarettes is a great example. It feels great uh, in the short term, but in the long term, uh, all the suffering that 
uh, is a consequent of it how how do you how do you recommend <laughs> doing the math for that yeah i mean it's something like smoking uh, yeah uh, obviously there are substitutes nicotine substitutes uh, you can also perhaps try switching to a different environment from the one you were actually smoking the cigar the the the, uh, the cigarettes in uh, uh, most of the vietnam vets who got hooked on heroin in vietnam actually broke the habit when they returned to the united states because all the condition cues and reinforcers uh, were missing but uh, yeah, uh, I'm not sure I have an off-the-shelf uh, solution though for a, uh, a chronic smoker who hasn't been able to uh, able to quit. No, I, uh, I wasn't asking for a solution. I was oh, asking sorry. in terms of how do you characterize morality of it? Um, yeah, essentially, uh, one is beha- one is behaving immorally towards future versions of oneself. Normally, one thinks of morality is the way one behaves towards others but in some sense i think one has an obligation to one's future namesakes and if one doesn't believe in an enduring metaphysical ego then in some sense by smoking now one is behaving in a very antisocial way to your namesake of 20 30 years time who may get uh, lung cancer or heart disease that's a, it's a slightly odd way of putting it, but I'm personally a skeptic about uh, enduring metaphysical egos. Uh, okay, um, you are um, uh, you're a vegan, and you're responsible for uh, many people converting to veganism. Um, I, a, what's your view on this? Uh, I mean, you are a Buddhist as well, where they talk about everything uh, has a sort of a everything is conscious putting it very crudely and i think this emerging view of panpsychism also talks about uh, consciousness and qualia existing at a very basic level and i'm sure this is a question you would have been asked uh, in terms of plants i think uh, it is easy to sort of imagine that uh, uh, animals uh, suffer so in terms of plants what's your view there because you obviously have to eat plants to survive and um- even if consciousness is fundamental to the world and this is a view i take seriously i'm a physicalist i think the world is exhaustively described by the equations of physics but at the same time i think it's possible i don't know but i think it's possible that the fire in the equations the essential nature of the physical is consciousness experience as you say this seems to invite the possibility that plants can feel pain and suffer however i'm i don't believe in plant sentience because i don't think plants can solve the binding problem that individual plant cells they are encased in thick cellulose cell walls so even if an individual plant cell uh, has rudimentary consciousness it's not phenomenally bound into a subjective experience there was no evolutionary pressure for plants or any organism without the capacity for rapid self-propelled motion to evolve an energetically expensive nervous system Uh, and yeah i mean when you're dreamlessly asleep there is no binding even if you're when you're dreamlessly asleep uh your individual neurons may have rudimentary experience it's not bound into a subject uh and so whether it's plants or digital computers or or rocks or classical information processes in general i don't think they're phenomenally bound subjects for experience so they can't feel pain they can't suffer so, so why are you saying it? they're not phenomenally bound or they're less phenomenally bound because no, i don't matter. think yeah uh, not phenomenally bound i mean to ignore one or two complications here but essentially yeah to think of them as discrete pixels and just as you know to give another example if if the world's population agree to take part in an experiment a kind of global brain implement any computation you like the world's eight billion people don't become a unitary mind or consciousness they remain individual uh, skull-bound minds communicating with with each other now how it is that biological nervous systems 
uh, are actually capable during waiting, waking life of creating this phenomenal unity that you and I are experiencing now is a vexed topic. I've written about it, but it's it's quite speculative. But I think one can be very confident in the case of plants or rocks or di programmable digital computers that they are not capable of phenomenal binding. Because if okay. they were capable of phenomenal binding, then physicalism would be false. Physicalism, as I said, is this, this idea that the world is exhaustively described by the equations of physics. Everything has to be consistent with this mathematical straitjacket of quantum field theory and general relativity. And that this rules out any kind of strong emergence. And if plants or digital computers uh, are subjects of experience, which I can't totally exclude, then strong emergence would be true. And strong emergence is akin to magic. Let's, I mean, I don't want to lose this thread because it's very interesting. Uh, what's your speculation on why would an organism like a human brain produce this phenomenally bound uh, consciousness, but a plant wouldn't? What's the difference? I tentatively, at any rate, am a believer in quantum mind. Uh, uh, essentially, there is an ontological unity to our states of consciousness that I think is found uh, on uh, at a sufficiently temporarily fine-grained level that if you were to probe the mind-brain, not at the scale of milliseconds as we do now, but femtoseconds that instead of discovering discrete feature processing neurons, edge detectors, motion detectors, color mediating neurons, I think one would find a perfect structural match between your you know, your phenomenal world simulation, what you're experiencing now with its individual feature bound perceptual objects and its, its, its phenomenal unity and the actual microstructure of the brain and essentially this is a testable conjecture i'm not proposing as someone like roger penrose or stuart hammeroff uh, well-known orc or orchestrated objective reduction thesis i'm not proposing any new physics i'm just accepting what is intuitively the reductio ad absurdum of quantum minds that the theoretical lifetime of individual neuronal superpositions in the central nervous system is femtoseconds or less. One person's reductio ad absurdum is another person's falsifiable prediction. And my tentative prediction is that if we use interferometry, we will discover the non-classical interference signature of a perfect structural match. Uh, so I hadn't really intended to talk about quantum, <laughs> quantum, quantum mind, but you 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 did ask uh, 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 here. It's but it's, right. it's it's controversial, and I could could of course be completely mistaken. <laughs> okay, uh, so in terms of say plants or rocks, um, again I want I'm curious at what level do you feel there is any sort of perceptual binding because it would come uh, it it would be an important question when it comes to ethics. Is it at the molecular level? Because if you're interfering there. You are mm. interfering with, uh, uh, yeah, pain, pain or pleasure, whatever is happening at that level. Yeah, and if you take you know, for example, and just yeah, just sorry. just as as like a illustrative example, I meant if I'm eating a plant, uh, it is going through me in terms of the digestion system. So at some level of disruption is happening. So where should I draw the line and say that I'm not probably cause any pain at all? It is possible that micro pain, min mini pinpricks exist at the subcellular level, but they are going to be utterly minuscule. And when you eat uh, a plant, uh, yes, essentially your digestive system breaks down uh, plant uh, uh, cellular cell walls, and it becomes quite uh, yeah metaphysical. Uh, this question of what is the precise cut off for phenomenally bound sentience. I think a worm, for example, a worm has a dopamine opioid system, and I think it's possible its ganglia experience 
micro pains, but a worm doesn't experience as much as a whale or a human. Uh, the actual molecular signature of pain, suffering, nastiness in the brain, it, it, it isn't known. Uh, but so long as there is no uh, phenomenal binding, it's in some sense morally trivial. Uh, I don't rule out the possibility that a bacterium or a single-celled organism or an individual plant cell, there is rudimentary unpleasant experience, but okay. uh, it, it lacks the moral urgency of full-blown suffering. Okay. Uh, so, David, since we are almost at the end of our conversation, I wanted to get back to hedonist imperative. Uh, when you wrote it in 1995, uh, what were you expecting to happen and how have you seen things unfold since then? Have we made any progress as a species towards uh, what you what you expected? Yeah, so I read the, the hedonistic imperative. Initially, I started writing it for analytic philosophers, but then this was the very early days of the web, uh, realizing that, hey, one could reach a much wider audience. And unfortunately, the hedonistic imperative uh, is written in a rather kind of clotted academic style for philosophers. But in terms of the actual substance, um, yeah, back in 1995, the human genome hadn't been decoded. The idea of synthetic gene drives that cheat the laws of Mendelian inheritance hadn't been uh, appreciated. Uh, something like cultured uh, meat was simply sci-fi. Uh, and yeah, so there has been a lot of technical progress since then, which is encouraging. And I think it becomes much harder now for critics to say that it is technically impossible at the biological genetic level to get rid of suffering. Um, but in terms of the, the ethical, ideological obstacles, they are clearly immense. If you think of the controversy that attended the first CRISPR babies in, in China. Now, admittedly, the scientist in question, he wasn't trying to directly alleviate suffering. He was actually trying to create smart babies under the guise of protection against HIV. Very unfortunate. But yeah, a lot of people are saying that this is unnatural. It is, it is, ir it is irresponsible. But yeah, essentially, every child born into the world today is a unique genetic experiment. I very much hope that, yeah, that if we are going to keep on with these experiments, that we will try to do so responsibly. Um, the transhumanist movement, uh, uh, essentially transhumanism as an idea has grown, but the transhumanist movement uh, has fragmented. As you know, back in 1998, Nick and I set up the World Transhumanist Association, now Humanity Plus, but there is a vast ecosystem of uh, different uh, transhumanist groups and organizations. And yeah, I mean, the ideas of uh, super intelligence, radical life extension, even a biohappiness revolution have continue to continue to, to spread but equally a lot of people still are very bioconservative status quo bias is still uh endemic so in spite of thinking that the future lies in superhuman bliss uh i personally you know <laughs> find the thought of the uh the obstacles ahead quite daunting uh, sadly i still uh, darwinian life has all kinds of ugly surprises uh up it up, up its sleeve by obstacles you mean mostly political and uh, cultural obstacles yes uh, essentially if we're going to get rid of suffering all prospective parents worldwide will have to agree to the very least pre-implantation genetic screening counseling maybe even genome editing and i think there's going to be a lot of resistance to this and i think yeah. it, it will it will change as 
influencers, celebrities, medical authorities uh, start sanctioning such interventions. It'll it'll most likely happen first of all with the recognised genetic diseases. Do it, I mean, very few people think that we've got an obligation to preserve cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease and so on. But most people, at any rate, are much more wary of the idea of pre-selecting genomes with an eye to raising hedonic set points or raising pain thresholds. I mean, I think it will happen. Um, that's my tentative prediction. But uh, whereas if there were global consensus about getting rid of suffering, I think a hundred year plan would work. In practice, sadly, I still see hundreds of years of, of pain, misery and suffering ahead. That's not the most inspiring uh, message to, to end on. But uh, yeah, sociologically, it may be realistic. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you and learn so much. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, the challenges that we face are minimal. I think it just makes sense to, I mean, nobody would prefer suffering over non-suffering. So I just hope as a species, we just make rapid progress towards the manifesto that you put out. Aris, thanks once again. Uh, some very thoughtful questions and chat to you again soon, I hope. Take care. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Bye, David. Take care. See you.